Awesome Monday morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's nice to see you here this morning. Uh, we're going to continue where we finished off yesterday in drawing out the line of Gideon. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are very grateful for each person who is studying these truths in your word. And we invite your spirit's presence as we open your word together. We need an understanding of these things because of the time that we live in. This line upon line uh, gives us light about the events that we are passing through. And they reveal to us your character. They bring a conviction and a power. And so, Lord, we ask that the work of the Holy Spirit can be present here. That inspired the, the scriptures, that it can uh, speak to us in interpreting their meaning and their significance for our lives today. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. May you give us clear minds and understanding and open heart. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see a couple that came in, a couple of different people joined since I started praying. So that's good to see. And uh, good morning, Angela and Stephen and everyone else. Now, um, I've been mulling over um, Gideon. Um, since our study yesterday morning. And uh, there's a couple of points that um, uh, that I, I, I'm not certain about. I'm not certain how to approach it. But one of the things we saw with uh, the story of Gideon is that we ended up with three lines based on Judges 6, 7, and 8. Uh, but we, we recognized that we needed to create a line of Gideon itself. And that line of Gideon ends up being uh, constrained within this 777 period of time from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. And, and then we drew out a line and we're gonna look at it again. Uh, but actually I'm proposing that we can draw another line, um, but addressing a different point. So you'll see, uh, what I mean by that. Now, in this uh, Midian oppresses Israel. So part of the things that when we deal with a line, we know there's a period of darkness that precedes it. And uh, Midian, uh, the name, uh, refers to, uh, to what? What does Midian refer to? And that, that happens for seven years. So what is Midian? I think it's like wilderness. No, it's strife. Midian is strife. And that's because of uh, the, the strife that existed, right? So the reason why the, uh, in dealing with the story of Midian, right? So that's the son of Abraham by Keturah the progenitor of the tribe of the Midianites or the Arabians, right? So these are the Midianites, tribe descended from Midian, the territory of the tribe descended from Midian, right? So this is a, a, a son of Abraham by Keturah. So this is a, um, obviously a close relative to the Israelites and they're under this oppression, but we have this symbol of strife. Right? So this strife is this conflict uh, that, that exists within the movement. And so we've addressed that as the period of darkness uh, regarding this line. And, and so one of the things that we believe that this is showing is this is addressing um, uh, the strife that existed between the disciples that is typical of what occurs in this movement. So we know from uh, 2014 uh, to at least 2019, maybe 2020, and maybe even to the present, 
I mean, we've had a division that exists within the movement and people have left the movement because of those, uh, those divisive issues, right? And we have way marks that mark those. Now, um, this oppression is symbolically seven years. So one of the things we had talked about was uh, the fact that um, uh, the book of Leviticus and or Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, um, Ellen White uses as um, a parallel prophecy. She puts the two together, dealing with the scattering of, of Israel by Assyria and Judah by Babylon. But also she recognizes that it was, has a partial fulfillment in the period of the judges. And uh, we have the seven years here attached to uh, the story of Gideon. And if we look at, um, and I know that Stephen has a list somewhere. I have a list somewhere of all the, I don't know where I would find that offhand really quickly. Um, I think I can find it here. So just hang on. So when we deal with this period of the judges, we have, um, uh, so you have, oh, let me see here. So we have all these different periods of oppression, right? We also have the periods in which judges occur, right? So out of all the periods of oppression, the only one that's seven years is the Midianite oppression. But we do have, um, uh, let's see, um, yeah, because we have some uh, judge. Well, we have a, a Ibzan. That's not Ibzan is one of the. Uh, it's twelve nine. So I think we have. Yeah, so we have, um, he was, that was a period of oppression that's, uh, let's see here, so Ibsen, yeah, he judged Israel seven years. So that's not a period of oppression, that's the period of a judge. So we have one judge who judges seven years, and we want to have one period of oppression that is seven years. Um so in the period of the judges, how do we how do we address Leviticus twenty six specifically? Why? I mean, Ellen White says that it's partially fulfilled in the judges, and and we do have this one period of oppression that's seven years. But you know, the other periods we got, uh, you know, eight years. 18 years, seven years. Um, there's a, a anarchy for 18 years. Let me see. There's um, Philistines for 40 years. Right, so there's some 40-year oppressions and some 40-year judges. So what, what would we see? How would we see this? particularly um, addressed in uh, with the period of the judges, that Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 um, are partially fulfilled in the period of the judges. So what does that mean, partially fulfilled? Any thoughts on that? that maybe they haven't reached their perfect fulfillment? Well, I don't know about perfect fulfillment. I mean, Leviticus 26 is an if-then prophecy, right? If you're not reformed by these things, then right. this will happen, right? Agreed. So, so I would think part of it is that there is a reformation process occurring, right? So they're not in the condition where the four seven times are completed 
for either northern Israel or Judah. I mean, they obviously are together here in this period. But the four seven times doesn't come into effect. Um, so one is we could say that it's only part of, of Israel that's being oppressed. That could be part of it. But see, now we're, we're making an application, of course, to our time. And we're using, right. the, period of, we're using the period of the judges uh, here to refer to uh, things in our movement. And, and in a sense, we would have to say in our movement, it's, I, I don't know if you would use partly fulfilled, uh, but our, our movement is not going to be destroyed and put into captivity. We're going through a process that the children of Israel went through uh, prior to them having a united, united kingdom, right? So Israel is not united until Saul, right? So Israel exists as all these different tribes. Um and, and we know that uh, that they're typical of the 144,000. So that's one thing we really haven't addressed too much in the period of the judges. But if we look at the 12,000 out of all the tribes of Israel in Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14, you have the 144,000 mentioned. And in chapter 7, of course, there's going to be 12,000 from each tribe. And these tribes are, are symbolic. They're not literal. You know, we don't take that literal Israel makes up the 144,000. It's spiritual Israel. And that the names denote character. Um, so the characteristics of these tribes, the diversity that exists, that become... Uh, 144,000 in Christ's kingdom. So when we look at the period of judges that precedes united Israel, it is typical of what's happening today before Christ returns. Does that make sense to people? That would seem logical. And um, now when we're going through these stories, we know that they're... Uh, they're part of these lines, right? So we've been able to see that there is a line of the judges, but that's part of a bigger line, right? That's a part of the bigger line, basically from creation to the second coming. And when we when we look at, at the judges, when we look at that line, so I'm gonna go there. Because I'm struggling with some some ideas that uh, you know we need to discuss, and I don't know where I put this all. So this is going to go back. I need to go back some other lines. So we have we have a lot of things that we've studied. other studies as well okay so when we go back to oh, way back here there's lots of cups so the cosmic line that's what we're um so we have the cosmic line this is our big line this is the biggest line we have from creation to the new earth and in that big line we have literal israel which is the empowerment of the first message Right. So this is how we take these these seven ages or whatever you want to call it. You know, the first age being from creation to the flood, the next age from the flood to literal Israel and then from literal Israel to the cross. And then uh, there's that transition there with the cross from literal to spiritual Israel. And then with spiritual Israel, we have this this period of, of spiritual Israel that leads up to the Sunday law. So in that Sunday law is included um, not just our history, but 
uh, the history, the transition from the Millerites to um, our time. So we haven't even got to that uh, yet. So we're still in this literal Israel part. And of course, the last one is the new heaven and the new earth, that way mark. So in literal Israel, we have a line. So in so the judges occur within this empowerment of the first angel's message on this cosmic line. But yet we know that literal Israel is typifying spiritual Israel. Right? So uh, spiritual Israel is the formalization of the second angel's message on this line. So the, the empowerment of the first message uh, connects to this uh, formalization of the second message. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then um, we have a line. So what I'm wondering whether we actually drew this out. I might have drawn it out on the board, but not in these charts. So because here in our studies, we're going to go you know, to Miller's lines, Moses line, Exodus line, uh, Egypt to the promised land line. So we got Joshua. So I don't think I drew out on, on in any of these diagrams um, a line showing literal Israel. So, so in order to really understand these lines, we need to we need to know where literal Israel lays or or, or sits in these lines, um, where in literal Israel the story of Judges is. So that we haven't we haven't decided. So I could do it on here, but um, um, so maybe I will. Okay. So I'm going to steal one of these lines here, which is a good one to do. I'll steal this judge's line. So something we should have done. So that's what I keep doing now is that I'm trying to move up these lines instead of just zooming in so much, because I think this gives us a little bit different perspective. Um, and let's see here. Now I could draw it on the whiteboard, but I think this might be faster. And more permanent. So we're going to call this the line of literal Israel. And um, so how would we, uh, we, we definitely need to formulate a line based upon uh, the Bible, right? So, I mean, we don't just make up lines. And now when does literal Israel arrive? When they cross the Jordan. Okay. Um, I mean, you could say they arrive when they leave Egypt, but right. yeah, when they they become they they are supposed to become a nation when they cross the Jordan. Okay. Right now, of course, Israel is another name for Jacob. So. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would say that literal Israel has to exist before then. It has to exist um, in connection, at least with Jacob. Right? Because you're going to have the literal children of Israel, the 12 tribes. Uh, they're going to be in Egypt. Now, you know, part of the problem here is, you know, this is the whole line of literal Israel. So... So these, there's going to be seven way marks in the line of literal Israel that we, we haven't really addressed. And, um, you know, Liz, and, and this is a reform line. So, I mean, lit, within these, these reform lines, we also know that there are periods of, um, during this time of literal Israel, I mean, they're going to go into captivity. Uh, they're gonna have the four, seven times occur right 
So there, there is a darkness that has to exist that each of these reform lines that are marked by, in this case, a way mark, that each of these reform lines are ultimately addressing. So in order to construct this line, and, th and this would have been a good thing to do, um, and I might actually even do it again in the, the line simply presented, but uh, at least something like this. <clears throat> because we need to construct a line, a reform line. And, and this is literal Israel. You know, this isn't dealing with spiritual Israel, right? This is dealing with literal Israel. Correct. And so literal Israel starts, you know, it, it's it's going to, to come into existence. I mean, that's the way that I would look at this line, because we, we're, we're looking at this line on the cosmic line. We have this uh, literal Israel waymark, which is the empowerment of this message, of that message of the cosmic line. And so literal Israel has a role in that cosmic purpose for mankind. And that cosmic purpose for mankind has to do with this promised seed, right? And so, so this promised seed is, is, first it's gonna be promised, that's the arrival of the first message. That's the everlasting gospel, this three-step testing prophetic message that is, um, uh, developing and demonstrating two classes of worshipers. It's a three-step testing prophetic message. So, so we know in that cosmic line, that first message arrives. It's the promised seed. And we're going to be following that seed. So Angela says, Abraham's call it of Ur. At the least, ancient Israel was predicted then. So that's what she wants to have for the arrival of this first message. Um, but let's, let's think about this, though, before we, we get to that point. So we know we have this cosmic line and the flood is going to be a formalization of that message. Now, why is the flood a formalization of the message of the promised seed? Because remember the reform line of the flood. We went through that. What, what's the problem? Why is the earth destroyed by a flood? Because of the pervasiveness of sin. Because the, the children of the sons of, of God saw that. Um, the children of man were fair. The yeah, daughters the, daughters, the daughters of men were fair, right? So this is the mingling of the seed. That is, the earth is becoming so corrupt that that promised seed, its existence is... Nil to little. Yeah. Nil. Right. So, little so we know that we need this Messiah to come. And we could say, well, you know, you, you could just have Noah become that promised seed or, you know, or one of his sons or something like that. But God is illustrating something here. So first, he has this message. And this message is about the promised seed. And now this image of, of God in man is so obliterated that God has to choose Noah and, and gives him 120 years to, to build this ark um, to just save some of that creation that had fallen. Now, when we can say this, there's an increase of knowledge here too. Um, this increase of knowledge is the genealogy, this information that is given by this genealogy, this, this line that's going to come um, from Seth, right? from Adam, from Seth, and down through this line. And um, so there's a formalization of this message in that reform line because of what that reform line is about. It's about the promised seed. 
and you're going to have 11 generations to the flood. And then you're going to have 11 generations to um, from the flood to literal Israel, which is, is how I understand it, going to Jacob. Now, in that, I think that we can say that when we zoom into literal Israel, that would include Abraham as part of that reform line. That is, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all, as we saw when we looked at them, they're the first, second, and third angel's message. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if we deal with literal Israel, must be the arrival of the first angel's message. Right? That is, they're going to have a reform form line where Abraham is the beginning of that. And that darkness is the period of time from the flood to, through the period of the building of the Tower of Babel and, and the scattering. And there in there, there is a reform line, so to speak. I mean, it's, it's, there is a reform line. It, it's maybe a negative one. But it, it's And you could say there is a progressive destruction of four, but we know when there is a progressive destruction of four, a reform line still occurs. So any story in the Bible is a reform line. But to get to literal Israel has to begin with Abraham. Um, and that would be the call out of Ur of the Chaldees. So I would agree with Angela there um, that, that the call of Abraham has to be uh, the time of the end. So there, there has to be something though that leads us to, um, to that. And that would probably be the first call. And then that period of time to when he actually leaves Haran. But, you know, that was Abraham's reform line. But when we're, so when we're dealing with literal Israel, um, we know that literal Israel is this reform line that we started looking at, but we never really completed because it starts with Abraham. And so how we would look at that, I mean, there's many different ways we could construct this line. Uh, one way, uh, just a simple way, if you looked at this line of literal Israel that's in front of you, and if you went Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph as the first four, Are all of those reform lines? Yep. And yep. and in the story of Joseph, don't we have the type of Christ? Yes. Okay. And then if you're going to think about the next ones, um, when it comes to literal Israel, so you've got Joseph. Well, then you know you would need uh, the Exodus to be in that line, right? So you're going to have Moses. And then what would follow would be as a major reform line, because you have to have that period of darkness. That would be the period of the judges. And then you would have a reform line dealing with uh, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon, right? Right. And then finally, you would have that reform line that's going to deal with, uh, um, you know, Cyrus, Cyrus's decree, the beginning of the 2300 days. And for literal Israel, can we see that that would be a valid way to write out this reform line? It would be dealing with literal Israel. It's not dealing with spiritual Israel. It's dealing with literal Israel. And, and that would be completed with the reforms that happen under Ezra and Nehemiah in that period of time. Does that seem reasonable? It would seem logical. Okay. Yeah, and, and I don't know how else I could construct it if I'm going to just address literal Israel and take the major reform lines. Because those have to be the major events. Um, now, you know, the thing is, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph, that's obviously just 
you know, period of 215 years, roughly, um, that you have to arrive to the second angel. But we know that we connect this story of Joseph um, uh, with, and, and in that story of Joseph, you're going to have Abraham blessing his 12 sons plus Manasseh and Ephraim. And, and that would, that whole situation with Joseph, that would be a rival of the second angel's message. But then we know that there's going to be um, uh, that period of darkness in, in Egypt. And then we have that major reform line of the Exodus. So we have Moses. And then, of course, we know that the period of the judges is this period of darkness. But, you know, we have reform lines all the way through this. But the question is, what are the major ones? And I think that these would have to be the major ones. But then if we look at the themes of these, right? So if we're, we're thinking about what a first message is, there, there are different groups of people being tested. So in this first part, it, the patriarchs are being tested, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and then Joseph, right? So there's this test here, and this is the end of, of the promised seed going from, you know, supposed to be the firstborn, never happens that way. Right? except maybe in Isaac, right? So, so you have this promised seed that's supposed to be to the firstborn. And, and there's the three things, the, the double portion, the kingship, and the priesthood that are being passed down. But in the context of literal Israel, these are going to be divided in the time of Joseph, in that reform line. And it's going to be that with the death of Jacob, that he's going to then divide the birthright amongst his 12 sons so that it's you get judah with the kingship levi with the priesthood and joseph with the double portion and so this this second message is going to be dealing with really literal israel in the sense of the sons right the tribes so that's going to be the second angel's message and it's going to be the working out of what happens with those tribes in in first uh, the period of the judges in their individualistic characters and how they interact with each other and are con in conflict with each other. Um, well, that's going to be the period of the, the judges after Moses's reform line. Before that, they're just going to be under Egyptian oppression, right? So they're under oppression. Moses arises as a reformer. They go through that reform line, but again, they're going to be fighting amongst themselves. And then finally, we get um the reforms that have under, happened under Saul David and Solomon that's the united kingdom uh, but again they they're, they're going to be moving through this progression but it's all about this this part of literal israel which is a part of the promised seed that is god has chosen a he's he's raised up a people a nation that is going to be a light to lighten the gentiles and that is going to be typifying the role of spiritual Israel. So I know we have to keep all of these things in our minds on how these lines unfold. Um, reading Angela's uh, comment here. So Exodus 36, 16 to 38 is great cross reference. Uh, for Genesis 6 to 9, although it omits specific reference to the flood and goes on. Okay, you're going to have to explain that. I meant is it 36. Did I put Exodus? <laughs> oh, I it's Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Okay, I just read Exodus. Yeah, you put his. I don't understand your abbreviation. With my ADHD, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just saw it as an Exodus. I saw it as an X, but, but yeah, Ezekiel 36. Okay. Um, can you explain, though, how this um, 
what you mean about the other stuff amidst specific reference to the flood and goes on into eternity. Um, reference for it doesn't talk about the flood, it just says that it is Israel had gone so far down, down in the basement of itself by mingling and imitating the other tribes, and then God promises to punish them, but He also promises to restore them. And so I thought, well, that's cosmic right there. I mean, yes, when they are cleansed from their sins, then they can re-inherit what was promised them, right? Okay. Then they can actually attain what was promised them, which was withheld from them because of their sins. Right. So so what happened to literal Israel? I mean, is God is illustrating, you know, our history at the end of the world. Through, through this past, but it's all part of a good plan. So when we look at what's happening today in the world around us, I mean, this is, this is about the promised seed, right? I mean, Christ obviously is that promised seed, but he needs to be demonstrated in his people at the end of the world, which is where more mostly where Christianity fails in that they just they want to go back to in that cosmic line they want to go back just to the cross everything was done there but nothing about how this what why this history has unfolded since the cross but right? they don't really have an answer to that um because they don't see those as fulfilled prophecies right futurism most of christianity that's either preterism or futurism and so the preterists just say all prophecy just dealt with the past, with Christ and so forth. There's no real prophecy for today. And in the futurist, um, all that history after the cross, they just basically ignore because all of the prophecies are really just about when Jesus comes back. So we just have this period of time where Christianity grows and develops, but none of that is prophetic. The only thing that really matters is... Um, that Christ is going to return. Some will say, you know, that's the times of the Gentiles during that time, sort of prophecy and, and all these things are set aside until, you know, the Christians get raptured away. And then the Jews have to go back to uh, accepting Messiah through uh, the law. Right. So they're going to have to build a temple again and all this kind of stuff, which of course denies the cross and the universality of the cross. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so we understand that this history is progressive and, and that it, it, it shows up in these lines. So, so now when we look at literal Israel, I think we can see that that's where we are in these lines. So then when we take uh, the period, so if we're, we're looking at literal Israel, we, well, probably we should draw these things up. Because, um, so just the simple way to look at this, is I'm just going to blow this. Uh, so we're going to have Abraham. We're going to have Isaac. And you can see how this relates to um, the promises made to Abraham. Because what is the darkness here that that is being addressed because remember this is in the empowerment of the first message which has to do with the promised seed and so abraham he's obviously related to that empowerment of that message because now we have a seed that's going to be chosen and and that's going to be israel right so so here we get abraham isaac and, and we could be much even much more specific when we deal with each of their um, reform lines. Right. So you have Jacob, who is also Israel. Right, so that's where the name of Israel comes from. <clears throat> And then you're going to have Joseph. Now, Joseph is a type of Christ. Right? So we understand that. Now, now Joseph, 
Now, the thing about this too, is we know that we have, um, now in this story of Joseph, there's lots contained in it because there's lots of reform lines. But we, we could also just say that the 12 tribes, but it's in the reform line of Joseph that we see this. So again, the story of Joseph, there's lots of reform lines. But I, I'm just putting Joseph here to represent that whole reform line all, all the way up to the death of Jacob, where the 12 tribes are then going to be blessed. Is that, is that fair just to put Joseph there and not to put more detail? Okay. Somebody has an objection or thinks of a better way of doing that. So, so then what you're going to have is you're going to have Moses, right? So this is, again, a very complicated situation because there's lots of reform lines in this reform line you're going to have um uh joshua right you're going to have the israelites coming uh out of egypt and then being in the wilderness for 40 years and then joshua leading them into the promised land and all those different events that we studied in the book of joshua But then we know that there is this period, and and you know, and here we're just going to say um, that the period of the judges is sort of this period in between, because what we're going to end up with is the United Kingdom, so United Israel, we'll call it, All right? So you have United Israel under David, Saul or Saul, David, and Solomon. And again, each of those have their own reform lines, but they're also part of a reform line, right? They're, they're the three-step testing prophetic message. Each one of them represents the first, second, and third angels' messages. And then we just finally have um, this, and this last reform line, uh, You know how to characterize this we could just say uh um, what would we call this history just i mean i i would just put it as ezra but i mean it includes all that history from you know cyrus to the three decrees but but this is all in the book of ezra so so we could just put ezra there Now, does this make sense to people then, what we've done here? So we can see, we know all these other reform lines exist within these lines, but is this the best way to lay out literal Israel? You know, the end of literal Israel is gonna happen under you know, the, the 70 weeks, right, which is a prophecy that begins in the time of Ezra. So in a sense, that's the fourth angel, which we don't have on this line here. Anybody disagree with this? Anything that should change? I mean, I think it's logical because I constructed it. So, but I just don't see how else we could do this. So now, so since we have this line of literal Israel, um, when we're addressing uh, the period of the judges, you can see that the period of judges is not really one of these way marks. So that means the period of the judges has to be a zoom into a way mark on a line below this. And I don't know if I constructed the line this way before when I did this. I might have put the story of the judges in there. I can't remember. But you can see that where, where would the judges fit in this? Would it be a zoom into a Moses reform line? Or is it a zoom into something else, 
right? So is it is it another step down? I would almost think it would have to be another step down. Okay. Because in Moses's reform line, so I know we have it somewhere. Um, uh, we have so many lines. Uh, because, you know, Moses has a, so let me see here. Um, it's going to be back here. But, um, maybe I'm going too far back. So that was the line. Okay, here it is. So we had these uh, reform lines. So we had, we, here we called it the Exodus line. Um, so we had Moses line, Exodus line. Moses line was really just a personal line of Moses. So maybe we, I could put the Exodus there in that other one. Um, but then in this Exodus line, we have, um, so we have Miller's line, Moses line, Exodus line, all the way to crossing of the Red Sea. And then what we haven't done is, um, you know, we're gonna have Egypt to the promised land as a reform line. So that's going to be a zoom into the Red Sea way mark, right? Moses line is just uh, basically a zoom into the Exodus line. So they're not really putting an order here. Um, and then Joshua is gonna have a line and then there's this conquering of the land that happens. Um, but here in this, uh, we have the Jericho line. <coughs> so that's, you know, so we have these different lines. Um, but in, in this, we don't really have something that we could zoom into as dealing with the period of the judges. So the judges is really a progressive destruction of four. It's 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 a it's a degeneration. Uh, even though you have all these reform lines, um, of and and we have to think about what this is about. It's it's about the promised seed, this promise that is made to uh, to Abraham, right? In this context of literal Israel. I mean, it's obviously the promised seed all the way going back. So, so here it's 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 really a wilderness experience. But if we were going to look at it as as a zoom into, in some ways, I think it would have to be a zoom into United Israel, or at least the beginnings of United Israel. I mean, it's divided Israel. So, so it doesn't really have a way mark here in how I've constructed it. But I don't see that I can place it as a way mark. Now, now in this, um, now one of the things about Joseph, so let, let's take a look at Joseph here. So, so I put Joseph there, and I could have labeled these things different. Like Moses could be the Exodus. Um, but Joseph is a representation of Christ. And, and he's also the fourth angel, but he's also the second angel, right? Depending on how, because there is another way to, this is the literal Israel line. And we could actually construct a line that's the first, second, and third angel's message, and Joseph being the fourth. So maybe there's another reform line that can be created that is a zoom into the United Israel reform line, but then the story of the judges is a reform line that's the first way mark of United Israel. Let's zoom into that way mark. 
So if we were going to deal with United Israel, uh, you know, we would have the first, second, and third angels messages being uh, Saul, David, and Solomon, right? So I'll do this here. So I'm just gonna... Correct. Yeah, so just to zoom into that one way, Mark, you know, if we're going to make this united Israel, okay, united Israel, then um, we could, you know, we would look at this period of darkness in a sense as the period of the judges. And then you're going to have a Samuel basically as the last judge, right? And and so we would say, you know, maybe the anointing of Saul is the arrival of the first message. And things in the history of Saul. And then you would have David would be the second angel. And then Solomon would be the third. And, and then, of course, you're going to have what happens after the third arrives. I mean, you're going to have uh, this completion of the temple and stuff. Um, but then, of course, there's going to be a falling away. Right. So, so we haven't even addressed the fourth thing, the fourth and the falling away after the third jet in our constructions of these lines. We're mostly looking at just the first seven way marks of a reform line. But, you know, some of the things that when we look at, when we look at then this, if this is going to be the anointing of Saul, but you also have Samuel there, right? And so there has to be a, a, um, a reform line addressing Samuel as well, because Samuel is a reform. So I don't know how to do that. Right. I, I mean, I don't know how to to construct all of these lines yet. I mean, I know I know the principles behind them, but I haven't constructed them. But Samuel is in the reform line of the judges. Isn't Samuel the third angel's message? I would believe so. Okay. So that means that we can take the period of the judges. Uh, if, he, if he's, he's not the third, he's the arrival of the fourth, right? So, so the period of the judges has to be a reform line, but it's just not represented in this line above, right? So, you know, we can see Saul, David, and Solomon in this United Israel. Didn't write them in. But we can see them there, even though they're not there. We, we can easily visualize those. But now when it comes to the beginning of that line, if we're going to zoom into Saul, Saul is going to include the story of Samuel. Right? So Samuel has to be there somehow. Um, but Samuel is, is the part of this other period of time. I mean, we could just say that he's there's just a period of darkness. We could argue that the judges is just in this line. It's just a progressive destruction of four. It's just leading to this darkness uh, where we're going to have to have this, this king raised up. But, but we haven't addressed all of these things. How does this kingship fit into um, the promised seed even? Because that's that's part of the problem with with all of this. Um, in, in when we look at the original promise, Adam and Eve, when they have their first son, which is going to be uh, Cain, you know, the Lord has given us a man. Looking at Cain as the promised seed, and and that's simply natural, right? The seed of the woman, that's Eve. She's going to have a child, and, you know, he's going to crush the serpent's head. 
And yet we know that this whole history of the world is the fulfillment of that promise. But it's it's done through all of this these these stories that are showing and illustrating how this is going to be accomplished so that it will be accomplished. Okay, so Moses was urged by uh, Jethro to delegate other judges to judge and well, I don't know if that relates to the judges, but because these are just deliverers that are raised up, but but maybe it does. But anyway, you, you see the point that we have this all of this history because God in crushing the serpent's head, that this is a is something that has to occur in in all of redemption history that this isn't just something that jesus could just come and do because he has to produce a seed he has to produce a people that can live in the most trying circumstances on earth so that all the redeemed, all that are saved by Christ, can be secure in heaven, and that their um, that the work that Christ has done for them cannot be questioned. That when Jesus says that those people are fit for heaven, that even Satan himself will acknowledge this truth. The wicked will acknowledge that they are unfit. And acknowledge that the righteous are fit. Because God, he can't just put anybody in heaven, right? That person has to want to be there. And safe to be there. And safe, right? And they have to understand that decision of, that they're making, right? So, I mean, this is the issue of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, which starts with that gospel promise, or at least... Uh, that's where Christ's part starts, so to speak, even though he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But we know that Satan introduces his lie, and Christ has to unravel that. And, and that's, what we're, what, that's what we are experiencing in our day-to-day in our -day lives, is we are experiencing this the outworking of that gospel promise given to Eve in the garden and to Adam as well. Because it's a promise to us. And, and we experience it. We see that the that they have the enmity, enmity towards each other, that those who love God are hated by those who, who don't love God. And we can see that these are really the results of these, re these reform lines result from this. Okay, so those are some thoughts which we're not going to completely uh, resolve because I want to bring you to another thought here. So um, I did something here. You can see you're not seeing double. This is just the same line copied. Um, but, uh, and I talked with Iran about it a bit before the study. Now, uh, one of the things, just one little detail here. When we go from June 22nd to June, December 25th, 2020, I put, put 187 days. Now, that would be an ordinal count. That is, uh, an ordinal count of 187th day from June 22nd. So, this is the first day. December 25th is the 187th day. So if I give an ordinal count as a cardinal number, it's called inclusive reckoning. So it says 187. That's inclusive reckoning. So I'm including this. But also June 21st is when the article or the ad was published in the Tennessean. And, and I mark June 22nd because it's, it's going to be the international attention that FFA gets on June 22nd. So... Yep, that was uh, published on the 21st. Yeah, it's published on the 21st. Yeah. 
but it uh, you know it's published on the 21st and of course a lot of the international media uh, they're seven hours ahead of the American so it takes time for uh, like or more but you know if you're in Europe you're going to be five six seven hours whatever depends where you are but in order for that that news to sort of a lot of the articles are going to be uh, dated on June 22nd, especially the international ones. But it first starts in the United States, June 21st. But if you count from June 21st to December 25th, it's 187 cardinal days. So one thing I could do here is just simply put uh, 21 in there like that. So it's going to be June 21st to 21 dealing with that whole issue. Okay. So that's one thing I wanted to clear up. The second one is that I believe that we can construct a completely different line with different dates, still retaining November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th. But this line would look like this. So what is this, May 27th to July 4th, 2020? Is that the hundred days of prayer? Pardon me, March 21st. I don't know why I typed, typed in. I was thinking March and then I typed in May, but March 27th, 2020. There we go. Sorry about that. So what is this, March 27th, 2020, to July 4th, 2020? So you 100 say days, days of, of prayer. prayer. Right, so it's the 100 days of prayer. So so if I want to put this here, I just put it's 100 days. We all know that's 144,000 minutes. And that's going to be um, including all of March 27th and all of July 4th. So it's actually at the end of July 4th that 144 hours, 144,000 hours are, are completed, right? And then you're gonna have um, to July 18, you're gonna have uh, 13 days, right? Now, if you just counted it, it would be uh, 14 days, but it's the end of July 4th to the beginning of July 18th. So that's actually 13 days. So you have, uh, and and I'm just gonna do it this way. Because now I should, I said hours, but it's minutes, right? Do like this. And this one's going to be oops, 14. So if we want to do it, maybe I'll just put it up above the line. Okay. So we got these periods of time that are very significant. So we have that 100 days of prayer that the Adventist church puts on. And then we have this period of time. Now we've, we've drawn this line out before. We just never created it as a reform line. Now, um, so this way mark here, that's not what I wanted to do. This way. Move this way mark over here. And then this is going to be January 6, 2021. Now, of course, this number of days isn't going to be uh, meaningful at all but for that. But it will be meaningful um, we go from here. I'm trying to remember how that works. So um, 
So we're going to have the start of the 100 days of prayer here, right? Or, or the, the, the end of the 100 and the start of 10 days of prayer here. So I'm going to put January 6th to 16th. So January 6th, that's going to be 187 days from July 4th. So, so all I did is I took events that we had already marked and significant spans, and I put them in here. But what is the justification for having two different lines of Gideon that, are, that occur within these 777 days? So let's, let's discuss what I did here, <clears throat> which means not me just talking. Yeah, one, one thing I'm I'm curious about, but I never looked into was what what were the themes of those days of prayer? <laughs> I feel kind of foolish now that I really haven't okay, thought well, about it before. Well, the first one dealt with the pandemic, so they actually brought in that hundred days of prayer to deal uh, with the pandemic. Okay, uh, the next uh, ten days of prayer. Now you'll see that one, of course, isn't an inclusive count. They just count from January sixth to sixteenth, but. Uh, it's one tenth of a hundred, of course. Uh, that one is is something they have every year, so they have it at that time, um, whatever day they choose to start it on. I can't remember. I think it's uh, they and it's so it ends up. I think it ends up on a Sabbath or something like that. But um, so they do that every year. So that was not pre-planned. That's just the general day, the ten days of prayer, right? But the hundred days of prayer was. Yeah, I think I recall that. <laughs> I think I recall the ten days, but I didn't recall any hundred days till now. So. Yeah. Yeah. So now, for me, that was significant, of course, because we had the March twenty seventh, twenty twenty date, uh, that um, was between March nineteenth, twenty twenty seven, or, or March twenty seventh, twenty nineteen, and March twenty seventh, twenty twenty one. So, um, but also it was the day I basically got laid off because of the pandemic. So, so it was significant in that way for me personally, but, uh, the hundred days of prayer, uh, fitting into that 144,000 minutes followed by 18,720 minutes to July 18th, we saw is very significant. It still is. And then after December 25th, so we had that echo of Nashville prediction uh, on the on the date that's the 20th day of the ninth month so the 20th day of the ninth month on the biblical calendar in 2021 is December 25th um, no am I doing this right no it's the it's not the 20th day of the ninth month it's the 10th day of the 10th month which is a sign of the siege so in 2021 it's the 20th day of the ninth month but that's going to be December 6th in that line above is going to be the 20th day of the ninth month. And December 25th, 2020, and you can see how, if, if you understand how the biblical calendar works, you're looking at 19 days later. So that means that the biblical ninth month is going to have 29 days. And, and so the 10th day of the 10th month is December 25th, 2020. And that's the symbol of the siege. And the siege of Washington happens 13 days later. So... So these are, we can connect December 25th to January 6th with the siege of Washington, but it's also the beginning of 10 days of prayer. So, so if we look at this line and we say, well, what is this line about? You know, because we have a period of darkness, well, what is being addressed here? And then if we look at the line of Gideon above, well, we have a period of darkness, well, what's being addressed? Now, in that line, we're dealing with the strife in this movement, right? That's what we dealt with yesterday morning.
you know, especially with December 6th and December 25th, we saw that the movement in 2020 um, with December 6th, and then we have the 25th where they have, um, you know, basically shut us out. But then if they would have waited to December 25th, they might have been able to look at some of the, the symbols there and the light that was coming to this movement, and this also with January 6th. But we can see how this, that December 25th date should have confirmed to the movement that we were on the right tra track about July 18th, because we could connect it to our, Ju our July 18, 2020 prediction in the Tennessean, right? But those people had already separated from us. By the time December 25th happened and you had this bombing in Nashville, I have no idea what they even thought about it, right? Because I have no I'm still, I'm, Yeah. I was still in the chat at that time. Yeah. Okay. And what did they think? So, uh, I, th I think it was Derek McWilliams or Williams, whatever his name is. Uh, he um, was a chat about it saying, why Nashville? Why on the 25th of December? Mm -hmm. um, but some people were saying that was, was nothing to do. You know, it was not, not the prophecy, it was not, it was not fulfilled, nothing to do with it. So, but there was some people there asking questions, sort of raising my eyebrows about it. Or yeah. Mm, they're thinking, you know, but then some people said, no, it's nothing to do with it. It's just, just ignore it. Sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what I figured would happen is they would have their eyebrows raised at first, but then dismiss it. Right. Sort of like, you know, when the Soviet Union fell in 1989, according to um, Louis F. Weir's prediction, or when 9 11 occurred and, you know, people were, you know, woken up for a moment, but quickly, you know, rolled over and went back to sleep. Right. But see, they had already cut themselves off from the information that could help them to understand. Like, I don't know how many people at that time recognized the 187 days from the prediction that was published in the Tennessean or anything like that. But there's so much that happened that closed them off to light with that declaration on December 6th. So thanks for that, Stephen. So that's useful information for me. Okay, so so we can see what that line is about. Now, what about the line below that? Well, what is that addressing? So we're saying it's the line of Gideon. But it's the same period of time. We're we're taking that same span of time. Now, we could say that you know this is actually just not the line because we do have in um this history i mean we we have this lines we have the publication in the tennessee and but we don't have all of these details right so so this line these lines here are addressing these events now the other thing is in constructing these lines um that we still haven't done which we're supposed to to do, I said we would do today, is that we're going to go through the story of Gideon and show how the events in Gideon, the symbols that are there, are going to give us these way marks. But now we have two separate lines that I'm saying are, are the line of Gideon, and that the events there are going to also mark another line that is parallel to it. But they're addressing different darknesses is and is that a reasonable thing to do i mean i know we haven't done it yet but is it reasonable to say that gideon can produce two lines like this that aren't zoomed into different way marks but are are actually the same line Now, I know we haven't done it yet, but is anybody adverse to, to examining this, I guess, at least?
Now, okay, so when we look at the second line, what, what would be just without looking at judges yet, what would be the virtue of taking that um, that 777 days and and creating this line? What, what would be the virtue of that? What, why would we want to do that? See, and, and, I can see the separation. Sorry, Theodore, I can see the separation of the true and the false priests that starts the line, and then you're ending on the 20th day of the ninth month, which is, again, the separation of people that want to follow Christ, that want to give up their idols, their false, their strange wives. So, so it, it's there. Right. So this is going to show basically two different groups that end up... Um, with two different results that are being tested during this whole period of time. So, so I think that's probably the best explanation we could have. Now, the other thing, if we look at the story of Gideon, because <clears throat> remember the story of, story of Gideon has this separation process that goes on. You know, so he's going to keep whittling this down till he just has the 300. And, and we have to sort of address that. So, you know, when we had done uh, these lines originally where we, and, and we just started drawing these out as, you know, a line, the line of Judges chapter six, and then we were going to, Know, finish that off and go into Judges 7 and then Judges 8. But when, when we first, in, you know, made these lines, we didn't, we didn't put these way marks here. But we saw that we could create um, these lines, even though we didn't mark the way marks. We were, in a sense, thinking about these way marks in the way that we have them marked below here. We just didn't write them in. Um, but mostly what we were doing is they, we saw that they led us to these dates, specifically January 11th to 12th, 2023. And it, it's, there, there's, there's something more that, that we need, need to be able to. So we know that this, this date here, December 25th, 2021, does connect to January 11th to 12th. 2023 right so we we know that we have a way of connecting it so we have lots of different lines that come from the story of the judges but this one primarily is the story of when we deal with um the judges that's going to be the story of samson right so here we're saying that gideon specifically is addressing this period of time in this movement Because really, that's what Jeff did. Now, when Jeff did that, he was looking at this in, in a very specific way that this was going to lead to uh, the Sunday law. You know, Nashville would be attacked by Islam on July 18, 2020. Um, so he's not foreseeing these waymarks here regarding uh, what's going to happen or these ones here. right? So he's not foreseeing that. Um, but he is looking ahead to this idea of this Sunday law. Now, of course, this is internal, which Jeff didn't expect, right? He expected that there was a possibility that this could re relate to external events. He knew that it could maybe just relate to internal, but, but he knew that it could relate to, uh, you know, it could possibly relate to external events. That's why we give the warning. That's why uh, we published the warning on June 21st in the Tennessee, right? Um, so there is, um, there's things about this line we're still going to have to address when we go through and read uh, the story of Gideon again. 
But there are two things that are really being addressed. Um, and we see this in, in the December 6, 2020. Um, what else are they addressing? I mean, in the declaration itself, they're addressing time setting. But what is the issue that had been discussed on the Sunday morning studies? What were we studying that I expected to continue on December 6th in the morning studies from FFA that were then canceled and we didn't have access to them, at least I didn't. And they continued them for a little while and then just everything fell apart. I don't know what happened there, why they didn't continue studying. But uh, what was the other topic? What were we studying Sunday mornings prior to December 6th? Does no one remember? I don't remember. Okay. How about uh, Daniel 11 verses 1 to 4? People remember now? Because what was the other issue of failed predictions that were going on? Because people didn't just leave because of July 18th. Trump well, lost the time setting issue. But we have Trump losing the election. Right? Correct. Correct. So this is the other issue. We have two predictions of Jeff's. Right? The Trump prediction and the July 18th prediction. And those two, those two predictions go hand in hand. They're, they're in a sense, they're completely separate arguments, but they're tied together uh, historically within this movement. Um, uh, but also in uh, what ends up happening with those that leave. So Trump losing the election really affects what happens on December 6, 2020, I believe. I, I think it's, it's, it's one of the, it, it, it definitely helped expedite that declaration even though prior to the election they had already had preset things. I think, I think many, many people became discouraged with Trump losing the election. That, that their confidence in what Jeff had been doing uh, was weakened. Um, it was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Does that make sense to people? I think so. Mm -hmm. So, so the other thing that would have happened, of course, if they had, you know, if the movement had held together December 25th and January 6th, uh, we would have had, if the movement had studied it together, we would have had a good understanding of the lines and why those things happened. But because the movement had fractured to that point, um, we had alternative uh, explanations for uh, these events for the failure of, of July 18th and for the, um, the failure of the Trump prediction. And, and, and these are going to come with, basically we have three. We have Odilio's going to address July 18th and Colin's going to address Trump, right? And, and I address both of them because I believe that and they're trying to give a justification for how we can retain those those predictions. Now, in Odilios, he's going to um, take up the the idea that the pandemic is just going to develop into the Sunday law. 
and that is connected to July 18th. So July 18th is really about that Sunday law that's coming that the pandemic is, is going to be a part of. And I don't take that position. I believe it was a, a, a type and that a lot of things were set in place to help that Sunday law come about. Um, but that it's not, it's not the actual Sunday law. It's nothing to do with Sunday. And it's, it's not going to have to do with Sunday. And Sunday isn't going to have anything to do with vaccines or a pandemic. That Sunday law, when it comes, is about Sunday. And I think that's something that we have to accept as Seventh-day Adventists. And I think if we think it's something else other than Sunday, we have bought into um, Parminder and Tess's argument about a Sunday law. Because they're arguing that there is no Sunday law. And in some ways, when we have something else that's not Sunday, that's a Sunday law, we're, we're taking that same position, even if we have Sunday in the mix. Um, and then... Um, was, uh, was Adelio saying that? Not exactly, right? So that's what I'm saying, is he's, um, he's not saying that explicitly, but that's what's really being implied because he's he's focusing on the pandemic, right? Yes. Okay. And so he's saying that the, the pandemic is going to be moving into the Sunday law. At least he's he's supporting that idea, whether he's saying it explicitly or not. Because and that's the position taken by many people in the movement, especially at that time. So when we get into uh <clears throat> 2021, you know, by the time Odilio addresses it, February 12th, right, he's looking at the mandates. And, and there's a belief in the movement at that time that the mandates are just going to get worse and continue, right, that this pandemic's never going away. But uh, one thing we know about these, these plans of these, the elite, is that this is a progression of events that have to occur they don't have to be the same thing they just have to be something that helps condition us or prepare us for the sunday law and i believe that that conditioning process one is we could see that people can be controlled but they're not going to be controlled by the same thing that is the pandemic would not if we had a pandemic three years from now again uh, there would just be too much skepticism in the population for the, that pandemic to have the same effect, right? The fear factor wouldn't be there. Even if, even if it was a way worse pandemic, people just wouldn't believe it, right? Well, certainly a lot less. <laughs> yes, there would be obviously some people, but that's not what they need. They don't need the pandemic. What they need is to condition people to accept a Sunday law. And, and they've, they've set things in place, whether wittingly or unwittingly. That's what has happened. And so we can see that, that people can be controlled and manipulated. Fear can create a, a situation where people will act in ways just like they did in Nazi Germany or in Rwanda that seem to go against their basic fundamental beliefs. So, so in these two alternatives, um, you know, the idea that the Sunday law is imminent, that Trump's going to bring it in, and the idea that the pandemic is connected to that Sunday law, these are the two ideas that Colin and Odili are presenting. But yet in what they're presenting, is something that needs to be understood and studied to understand our lines. That is, if they understood our lines correctly, they wouldn't draw the conclusions that they did. And, and so I think that in this, this story of Gideon, that's what we, we see. So we can see that there are two different lines here. One is specifically addressing Trump, and the other one's specifically addressing July 18. That's the way I would see it. But anyway, we have to go because we're a bit over time. So um, we'll come back to this tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, 
uh, thank you for your goodness and love and for the way that you take care of us and for each person. We pray for each person in this movement. We pray for Colin and for Odilio and um, uh, all of the people who you have given light to. We lift them up in prayer. We ask, Lord, that you can continue to work in their lives and that um, as we come to the upper room, experience that you have prepared for us, that we can see our sins. We know, Lord, that um, you've been giving us light because we study and not because we are in any way better than anyone else. We know, Lord, that um, we sometimes um, can see things incorrectly regarding other people, and I pray that you can help us to recognize that each person in this movement is precious and that uh, that you can give light directly to any person, that no one is, that you are dependent upon no person to accomplish your work. But you do need a people working together. And so we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can help unite our hearts, unite this movement so that we can accomplish the task that you've given us. May your angels watch over us today, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.